Welcome. These are the inner views. Inner views. A deconstruction of carceral life in California. Brought to you by the Davis Vanguard and the Ben Free Project. Thank you for listening. Today's episode of Everyday Injustice comes to us from our Witness Carceral Journalism platform. Here's Ghostwright Mike, a Vanguard Carceral Journalism Guild fellow, giving us perspectives of carceral life. What is adulthood? Some legal scholars, arguing for a reset of the rules for how we sentence young offenders, call it nothing more than an indefensible social construct that lives inconsistently among a family of sibling policies that govern what we can and can't do, extending out to govern how we punish the dangerous few. In most jurisdictions, we can't drive until age 16. We can't drink alcohol until age 21. We can't rent a car until age 25. And we're not required to obtain our own personal health insurance until age 26. And yet, at age 18, we can consent to sex, enlist in or get drafted by the military, and be condemned to die in prison despite being deemed a youth offender. Because we've drawn this imaginary line in the sand called adulthood without it being tied to anything that concretely distinguishes this chapter of life with real meaning. In the seminal case deciding whether or not it was constitutional to sentence a juvenile to life without the possibility of parole, LWOP, when the court in Miller v. Alabama asked the parties where to draw that line between juveniles and adults, the government's counsel answered, I would draw it at 18, because we've done that previously. We've done that consistently. Slavery was similarly justified as time-honored, which begged the question, was the we've always done it this way argument a sufficient basis to justify the killing of a young citizen in the name of the state? At what age are we as a society to decide that there's no hope for a young offender to transform and justify throwing them away? Since 2005, five times in the last 20 years, through a series of opinions that include Roper v. Simmons, Montgomery v. Louisiana, the aforementioned Miller, Jones v. Mississippi, and Graham v. Florida, the court has relied upon a set of developmental characteristics of youth to mitigate the culpability of adolescent and young adult offenders based upon a growing body of brain science research affirming how the brain's cerebral cortex, where executive functions reside, doesn't fully form until age 25. That science has served as a basis to stretch the meaning of diminished culpability beyond age 18 and extend it to age 25, rendering descriptors like juvenile and adult no longer applicable to a class of carceral state residents the courts and legislatures now refer to as youth offenders. In California, following the Alabama decision, the legislature passed a youth offender parole statute in 2013, giving opportunities for early release to individuals who committed their crimes before the age of 18. In order to align California law with then-recent court decisions identifying Eighth Amendment limitations on LWOP sentences for juvenile offenders, rooted in the brain science that applies to all similarly situated youth offenders 25 and under. In more recent years, the legislature has expanded the statute to include certain young adult offenders as well. Under the current version, most persons incarcerated for a crime committed between ages 18 and 25, serving an indeterminate life term, are entitled to a parole hearing during the 15th, 20th, or 25th year of their incarceration in order to afford them a chance to demonstrate parole suitability on the basis of having fallen within this age-based category tied to the brain science. They are considered redeemable. However, Not all youth offenders are eligible for parole hearings. The statute excludes, among others, those serving LWOP for crimes committed after the age of 18, leaving behind an entire group of youth offenders aged 18 to 25 who live and program among their lifer youth offender peers but who are condemned to die in prison. They're considered irredeemable, though the same brain science applies to them. When Kim and Khloe Kardashian traveled into Valley State Prison this year to shoot an episode of The Kardashians with film producer and youth offender advocate Scott Budnick to highlight prison reform, The three incarcerated residents who were featured in on-camera speaking roles for their Hulu series were members of this very distinct offender class. Youth offenders under 25 sentenced to LWOP, who, while having each been technically still teenagers at the time, and thus within the brain science threshold when they committed their crimes, are nevertheless prevented from laying claim to its mitigating implications and thereby condemned to die in prison. Louis Baca is one of those three youth offenders featured on the show who spoke about trauma reconciliation while seated in a processing circle with Khloe Kardashian and CDCR's associate director Tristan Lemon. Louis was sentenced to LWOP for a passenger seat drive-by shooting he participated in as a teen. He was the shooter. Had he exited the vehicle and walked down his victim and shot him at point-blank range, he'd not have been subject to the drive-by shooting special circumstances allegation that exposed him to the death penalty and now has him shelved forever. To be sure, a deadly shooting remains a deadly shooting. But in his case, had he pursued his victim on foot, 
and been more menacingly proximal to his victim when he pulled the trigger. A more up-close and personal death, he'd never have been exposed to Elwap at all. Nevertheless, he, like many youth offender Elwaps in his circumstance, who are now more than a quarter century deep into their prison terms, are the very college graduates, specially trained mentors, and peer support specialists facilitating the self-help programming the state deploys to its youth offenders who are serving life terms. The irony is glaring. Lewis advocates for the governor and legislature to amend the youth offender statute to bring sentencing equity to youth offender LWAPs aged 18 to 25 by affording them a similarly staggered parole hearing during their 25th year of their incarceration. At the high end of the intervals afforded to youth offender lifers and after the quarter century mark that signifies the baseline term for first degree murder convictions in California. Today we hear from him. These are the interviews. Interviews. The Deconstruction of Carceral Life in California. Everyday injustice. Too many wrongful convictions. Corruption has infected the criminal justice system. Leaving too many people helpless. Fighting for their lives instead of receiving justice. People suffer. Is that why they say justice is blind? Today on Everyday Injustice, we have Louis Baca. Hey, Louis, how are you doing? Hey, good morning, David. I'm doing okay. Uh, thank you for having me, and I'm grateful to have this space uh, to share my life experience as a youth defender since life at Alpha in California. And and where are you incarcerated currently? I'm in Valley State Prison, which is in Chowchilla, California. And briefly, just tell us kind of your background and how you ended up where you are now. Okay. So, I mean, I'll, I'll start, I mean, at, at early, at the earliest age, uh, as far as I remember, uh, when I was two years old, uh, I was able, I mean, I witnessed my dad kill my mom, and it sent my life on a trajectory towards who knew what, and I was filled with nothing but pain initially, fear and pain, and because I didn't have the coping skills available to me, I wasn't taught those skills. I just looked at life and adapted to my environment, and I was shown that silence, violence, alcoholism, drug abuse, and being reckless was an acceptable form of dealing with pain. Uh, obviously, it wasn't, and it, 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 you know, crime progresses. So when you start off at, at stealing maybe a piece of bubble gum as a kid, something that's considered innocent, it escalates, and if you know you're stealing cars, you're robbing people, you're breaking into houses, and ultimately people make the, the horrible choice of stealing a human life. Um, when I was convicted of first degree murder for shooting out of a motor vehicle and killing my victim, uh, his name is David. I was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole plus 10 years. What I didn't know at the time was life without parole meant die in prison, age out of life. So in the beginning, I didn't understand what it meant. You know, I was frustrated. I had all these, these issues going on, nothing to resolve them. And I set myself on a course of education, self-education, but also worldly education, and eventually legal education. And that brings me to you today. Yeah, so how old were you when when this all went down? I was 19 years old. So you were an adult in in some senses, but we now know that uh, brain development doesn't uh, stop at uh, you know, 18, uh, it actually continues to develop until the age of 26. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and how the law works with respect to youthful offenders? Yes. So obviously I was convicted in 1997 at 19 years old, and these laws that they unearthed have always been in existence. It was just considered uh, California Youth Authority laws. Right back in my day when I was a kid, they uh, kids that committed crimes, teenagers would go to YA and they would age out of YA at their 25th year. If they were not corrected by that time, they would go to prison at, at 25. 
And if they did, they would, they would go home if they would correct themselves. So the law of the brain science has always existed. It just was never applied to, to the adult judicial system. And around 20, I don't know, 13, 2014, they started to see, you know, mass incarceration isn't the way to solve any problems. So they unearthed the law and applied it to adult, uh, adult offenders. The thing is, because of the sentence, they're saying that the brain science doesn't apply to what is considered youth offenders, 18 to 25 years of age. And that's where, that's where the problem lies. And can you talk a little bit about the difference that you've seen in yourself from the time that you were 19 to the time that's now, and that's what, 27 years? Yes, sir. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a world of difference. You know, uh, I, I like to quote the Bible a lot, and one of the, the, the passages that comes to mind is when the Apostle Paul says, when I, was a th- when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I acted like a child, I thought like a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. And that didn't happen to me until, I don't know, let's say 30, 30 years old, there was an awakening, a mental awakening, emotional awakening, that happened and I started to see just the foolish behavior that I I was committing didn't get anywhere. It wasn't worth anything. You know, it was all to be praised, it was all to be accepted, to be viewed as some image that is really detrimental to life in general. And I I mean, that's when I saw like at nineteen what do you really know? Do you have life experience? Are you traveled? You might be having a job. You might have your second job. You might have a car payment. Um, but you're still, you don't know about anything. There's no lived experience there. And the maturity, the impulsivity of a 19-year-old is very different than the reservations of a, of a grown man. And I've, I've always said the comparison, the difference between a man and a boy is the man has the ability to control his actions, where the boy doesn't, the boy just acts. So, from your perspective, how can we improve things in the system? Oh, man, that's a, that's a really good question. There's a lot to improve. Um, one of the things would be to have a culture change in prison. You know, I come from an era where it's considered static security, the relationship between guards and residents, which used to be called inmates. Static security means it's it, yes, sir, no, sir, you just follow the rules, and if not, there's repercussions to be had. Sometimes it means, you know, being, being assaulted by staff. Um, the way that California is shaping up to be, there's some, it's called dynamic security now. And that just means to to be more engaged, to figure out why you're acting this way. Why are you doing what you're doing? What choices are you making? Can I get you in the program? So that's one thing. Another thing is to not forget about youth outwalk as a part of the change in the system that needs to happen. What I've seen is 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 a pivot. You know, they started doing all these sentence reforms, and then around 2017, 2018, it pivoted, and they focused on reentry now. Let's make these men successful, probably, these men and women. But there's a segment in California that's being forgot about, that's being overlooked. Whether we change for the better or not, they don't care because we don't have that opportunity to reenter society. And Those two things predominantly will help. And you mentioned earlier that when you went in, you didn't understand that LWAP meant dying in prison. And so that's, that's, that's a death sentence in a lot of ways, right? Um, For sure. And what are your thoughts overall on LWAP? I mean, I mean, obviously when people hear LWAP, they think, okay, these are really dangerous people that should never be out. But a lot of people are more like you, right? They, they made a mistake. They, they grew up in trauma and then, you know, they kind of outgrew that. And so a lot of people are, are still in prison for years and years and years who really aren't very dangerous. Very true. Um, I mean, you said a lot right there. And the one thing I will focus on is, is 
dying in prison, you know, when we wake up, we're the only sentence that has a question mark on how I'm going to shape my day. You know, what, what am I going to do with my day? Am I going to change or am I going to stay the same? The fact that many of us, because we come in the young, specifically about 60% of the Alwa population in California were youth defenders upon committing their crimes. So because we were so young and we start maturing and we start exploring ourselves and wondering what's going on and giving these opportunities to go to school, we change. And then after that change, it's like, what am I doing? Why am I changing if it's not for self? Right? I'm not given the opportunity to go home. I don't know if, if I'm going to die in here, but the reality is today that that's what could happen. And coming from a traumatic background, it makes you question, it's an existential question of why did I go through all these things in life? Why did I commit my crime? Why did I pass this pain on, this violence on to another family when there's a better way? So we, we, we turn into gold men in prison, we give back, we teach younger men, we teach each other how to be better. We keep each other accountable. You know, there's, there's highs and lows with every day. But if I'm having a low day, I can go to an LWAP and get the support I need, and he can do the same. And the fact that we're not giving relief is, is, is a very big problem. And, and talk a little bit about some of the programs that you've been through that you have found helpful. Sure. So... My first group was called uh, California Gang Members Anonymous, which had been changed to Criminals and Gang Members Anonymous. This is the foundation of my, of my growth because it taught me the cycle of crime that, that we live. And even if I didn't understand it at the time, I didn't believe in it. I was sitting in group judging everybody. You all, man, you guys are liars. I still stayed in there. I stayed in there for about five years. And I didn't say anything. I just sat there and listened. And then one day I found my voice and I started speaking and giving back. And it felt good to get these things off of my chest, to get the reality of my life out of me and get feedback from it, constructive criticism, but also positive feedback. After that, I um, participated in something called um, Victims Awareness Defender Program. And that taught me the depth of the pain that I committed, not only my, on, on the man that passed away, but also on his family, in addition to the first responders and then to the community. There's layers and layers and layers because I believe in six degrees of separation. I know that I impacted the world by my choice. Uh, and, and Lou, you were telling us, you know, about some of the programming that, that you felt like uh, worked. Um, you know, for you, what what made the biggest difference? Was it just kind of growing up, or what, or was it more than that? It was it was more than just growing up. Growing up had a, a major factor in it, but it was the education that I committed myself to, and learning about how I hurt other people. You know, the, it, I, you know, criminals are very self centered individuals, and the victims awareness group that I went to showed me like it matters more how I affect the next man and how that person affects me. It's up to me to, to, to be forgiving, but I can't, I can't hurt people. Like, that's the bottom line. The, my speech pattern, my, my tone, uh, my actions specifically, how am I affecting somebody? And so it was that empathy that opened up inside of me that changed me from being selfish to being aware of society, aware of my surroundings. That, that really started to change me. You know, whereas I was heartless at one point. I mean, TV shows were making me cry. You know, there was a show, uh, I think it was called Extreme Makeover Home Edition, that I used to watch, and the kindness that those people gave to each other impacted me. You know, I would cry be, behind a good, a good gesture, a kind gesture. And that's really what solidified the change. The final thing was, I was a part of a juvenile diversion program where at-risk youth, teenage youth, would come into the prison and a group of us guys would mentor them and show them a way. Uh, we would take guns off of the streets 
and watching them understand what we're saying, what we went through, that we were just like them, and seeing the light bulb turn on in their brains and change their life, those three groups are what really made me feel like this is the path, this is what's meant to happen. This is how we stop things from, from escalating in life. This is how we shut prisons down even. Let's educate instead of... Um, and I was also wondering, you know, how you go about motivating yourself when you have this sense that there's a good possibility you may not, not get out. How do you motivate yourself to self-improve? Well, my motivating factor is I've understood that the only way I can give back to life for taking a life is to be of service to others and show them the way and share my life experience, share what I've learned, and hopefully stop crimes from happening. You know, there's a slogan that uh, CGA has, and it's called uh, one, less, one Less Crime, One Less Victim. And ultimately, at the end of the day, that's what we're looking to do is create less victims. You know, we want to heal our community. Another saying is hurt people, hurt people, which I'm sure you're familiar with. But the opposite of that is heals people, heals people. So if I'm actually healed, I'm supposed to be healing others. And that ripple effect will pass on and hopefully we'll be able to change society in that way. So my motivating factor is to stop crime from happening. So let's... Let's go to kind of a broader picture of the issue of youth LWOPs. Um, you know, it, it seems to me, and I know that this is a controversial view, but that that young people being held for the rest of their lives for mistakes that they made in their youth um, doesn't make a lot of sense from a, a, a large number of perspectives. Um but how do you, how would you communicate that to people that have themselves been victimized by crime? So I understand uh, the the depth of pain that victims go through. You know, coming from the background that I did, where my dad killed my mom. You know, the, the perennial question that a victim has is why did this happen, and he never answered that question, actually. So there was frustration, there was hatred, there was rage. You know, the Bible says an eye for an eye. So all these things, all these doctrines, ideologies float around in our heads. Um, but the victim, I think dialogue needs to happen between offenders and victims. There's something called restorative justice. And restorative justice focuses on not only the victim, but also the offender and the community and to encourage dialogue to happen because once understanding exists, peace can take over and it doesn't have to be a direct dialogue between offender and victim. It could just be any offender and any victim. Um, and the injustice part of youth dying in prison is the fact that brain science exists that allows other youth that was sentenced to life for very similar crimes to go home, to present themselves to the parole board, which are the gatekeepers to society. That exists for lifers, but not youth Elwa. How does the sentence preclude me from the same brain science that affects somebody else? And what do you say to those who argue that there's this bright line in the sand drawn at the age of 18? And so if you're 19, then then you're just, you know, tough luck. I say that they're, they haven't done enough research. They're not reading the laws that exist. They're not following cases that have, uh, that have went to the courts where the justices are requesting legislature to change the law so they can re-sentence youth offenders sentence to LWOP and give them a chance to go to the parole board and prove their change because CDC has an R at the end of it which stands for rehabilitation. So you're rehabilitating all of us LWOPs also, but you're not affording us the same screening methods that others are being given. And the line in the stand really doesn't exist 
because laws like Senate Bill 260, Senate Bill 261, Assembly Bill 1308 expanded the age up until 25. So science and existing law are going hand in hand. Why not allow youth outwops to be in that same category? And from your perspective, I mean, how would you structure it? Who deserves a second chance and who doesn't? Well, I mean, there's a saying in life that everybody deserves a second chance. You know, as somebody that took a life, I don't want to say I deserve anything. Would I be like to have a second chance? Yes, I would, for sure. Because as I matured into a man, into a man, I wonder, like, what is this all for? What did I, you know, what did I do that is different to the other person that committed the murder? So I believe that the parole board determines that personally. They, they like I said, they're the gatekeepers. They have, I mean, they're experts in, in this field. They know how to see what's real from what's fake. And a lot of times, they deny people parole when they can see that that person hasn't. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. It's very apparent in our speech, in our conduct in prison, and they have access to all of that. So, giving a second chance would go to the board. It's not a get out of jail free card that I'm asking for. It's, it's an opportunity to present my change to the people that already do have that job to screen it. And what about the fact that some people will say, well, the person you killed didn't get a second chance? That I mean, it's the truest statement in the world. He didn't give a second. He wasn't given a second chance. I, I, I was the judge. I was the executioner. I was the jury, all for nothing. You know, this man lost his life for no reason other than I thought I was tough and I wanted to be tough and I was afraid of of being weak, uh, of giving a pass. You know, and I, I can't imagine the sleepless nights, everything that my victim's going through. I mean, every day, that's never gonna, that's never gonna stop. And so that's where like I'm torn between the changed man that I am and the, the, the reality, the permanent crime that I committed. You know, maybe, maybe I'm asking for too much. You know, I thought of that, you know, late night, staying awake, just overthinking life. Maybe we don't deserve a second chance, even though I believe we do. And from your perspective, how would you give back to the community if you were uh, to get a second chance? So my thing is, I would love to get into the education system because these same issues that I grew up having as a kid, as, a, as an adolescent, are still happening in communities worldwide, but specifically in California. And I've always wondered why did I have to come to prison to gain the tools that help me cope with the trauma in my life? You know, we teach kindergartners, preschoolers, primary colors, ABCs, one, two, three. Why is a life class not given age appropriate at the kindergarten level all the way through 12th grade? And I would love to give back in that way to, to equip children with different methods on handling the domestic violence they might be seeing, the drug abuse in their community, uh, violence in general in their community, alcoholism. You know, we're, we're very impressionable as children. And I had a few positive role models in my life. However, they weren't highlighted because the majority of my neighborhood was negative. So the light was swallowed up by the darkness, and in school is where the peace is at. That's when you're, you're fun-loving, like you're, you're enjoying your friendships, you're enjoying playing on the playground. You might even enjoy studying in class, and that's the proper area to, to, to attack criminality and to teach kids different. So that's how I would give back. I would continue the mission, mission of stopping crime. And what would you, if you could have a conversation with the 19-year-old self, what would you tell yourself? And would it make any difference? I would tell myself 
to ask for help, that it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to say you don't know the answer. It's okay to be weak. It's okay to be a nerd. It's okay to, to not go out and kick it with people. It's okay to be in school. Like everything that you think is not okay is actually okay. It's the better version of okay. It's okay to, to, to have a job, to be a working man. You don't have to be on the streets selling drugs, um, staying out all night, partying with, with your peers. It's, it's the most inappropriate way to handle life. And I would tell him not to commit that crime, to put the gun away, to give it away, to throw it away, to turn it into the police. And be strong in that way. Be a leader, a, a leader for positivity, not, not a leader for destruction. Do you think you would have listened to yourself, though? Um, I would have listened, but I have acted on it. I mean, the mindset that I had at 19 years old, I was very rebellious. I was very much a, a, selfish, a selfish teen. Uh, I really thought I knew the answers to life. I want to say I would have listened. I might not have acted on it initially, but I would have listened. But it's also, it's teacher appropriate, you know. It's up to the teacher to reach the student. So the grown man in me wouldn't have let up. It wouldn't have just been one conversation I had with my 19-year-old self. I would continue. You know, I think one of the big questions that kind of goes through everyone's mind is, you know, whether or not somebody deserves a second chance. And I thought you were really honest about how you approach that question that, okay, you know, you probably don't deserve a second chance, but you feel like you can contribute to society. And I feel like that is really a key question that people have to kind of get past that. Okay. At some point, you know, you can never bring back somebody's life. Unfortunately, uh, I'm sure you would, would do that in a heartbeat if you could. Um, but, you know, you can also be a resource for other people and you can, you can save lives in other ways, right? Sure. Uh, you can, you can yeah, save really people easy. from going down and ending up incarcerated and you can also save people from getting killed. Correct. For sure. I mean, that's where my passion lies. I believe that teaching kids the right way to deal with issues, conflict resolution, you know, everything is about social media. Everybody's looking for life. And so what I see on the news is a lot of fights in school or, or film and then posted and everybody makes comments on it. And these are the same things that I went through as a kid, except it wasn't as broadly viewed. You know, but it within my family, within my neighborhood, I was giving those same likes. I was giving a pat on the back, which means I had an insecurity issue. I, I needed somebody else's affirmation to make me feel good about myself. And that's where everything lies. That's the problem with society. Who are teaching kids how to be strong individuals? Why do I have to go to the next person to gain my strength, to view myself right? You know, there's, there's a... That's where the that's where the issue is. I, I, kids need to be educated on how to be okay with not being liked, with not being what is considered equal. You know, societal norms. I don't have to be like you to be okay. I don't have to be like you to to be successful. Your route doesn't have to be my route. There's many ways in life, but being taught how to deal with these traumas are, are the most important thing that we can teach children as well as each other but they're not being done and it makes me wonder why like why is this not how is nobody else seeing this and finally a lot of people don't get to talk to people like you and and so uh for them you know of course you know you're you're kind of this dark box and 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 maybe a little bit scary um but this is an opportunity to kind of talk to people directly, uh, even though they can't talk back to you and interact. Um, what would you say to people that have never encountered somebody like you and might be scared at the prospect of giving someone like you a second chance? I would say I'm sorry. I'm sorry for, 
for this being the way that you have to hear me. I'm sorry for not being my, my best version of self, uh, for even affecting you on some level. Going back to restorative justice and, and victim awareness is I impacted the world. This conversation might be triggering for somebody that's been victimized, that had their, their family member murdered. And I apologize for, for any of these discussions being uncomfortable. But I would also ask for a chance, a chance that, that to see me, not only for the, the, the choice, the negative choice that I made, the horrible choice that I made, but for change, the changed man that I am. You know, I'm not a teenager anymore. I'm not operation, operating on impulsivity. I, I, I take a step back and I look and I think about my actions, my words, how am I going to impact somebody else in the same way that you can view somebody else that has murdered somebody and give them a chance is the same way that I'm going to have to be viewed. You know, I, I just want a chance. Like I really do. I, I just wonder what's my purpose in life. You know, what is this all about? What am I here for? You know, so if we could take away anything from this discussion, it would just be um, it would be that not everybody was in their right state of mind when they committed their crime. They're going to excuse it. it. It's just a reality. And I think that's a really important point because, you know, a lot of people forget that, you know, there's not a bright line between victims and offenders. And and what your story illustrates once again is that hurt people hurt people, and most people that end up in prison started out as victims. And, and then they never were able sure. to deal with... Um, those issues and it carries through. And so, you know, there, there's really not this bright line that people think, Oh, we have a world of victims and we have a world of offenders. There's a lot of gray and, and they, they bleed into each other. So I, I feel like that is something that the public doesn't really understand. And the other part is that you were a kid. I, I mean, you know, whether you're you're 15 or 19, and how old were you when your father uh, killed your mother? I was two years old. Oh man! So, I and I mean, so so old. that is that is like unseen um, trauma um, that that just carries down over the generations. For sure, and you know, like so, I I grew up essentially without both parents. Now, my maternal grandmother won custody and raised me, and inside of that was, like, its own experience. You know, I'm an only child, and, and uh, again, I don't say these things to justify anything. I don't minimize my crime. I, I acknowledge what I did. I'm responsible for what I did. But my life was still my life. My childhood was still my childhood. And the, the, the biggest issue was that nobody taught me how to deal with these things, these emotions. I'm a kid. I'm in elementary school. I'm in baseball crying at night, but turning it off in the daytime. And when you were raised in a masculine Mexican household, tears are not appropriate. Tears are not okay. So you have to learn how to turn that off in a young age because you're going to be judged. And I learned that at about seven or eight years old. But all it did was bottle up everything. There's a legal term called tinderbox aggression, where it's just pretty much it's, it's a bottle with nothing but carbon in it. It's being shook and shook and shook. And at some point, it's going to explode. And it doesn't excuse it again. These are just facts of life, the reality of the situation. That was never actually highlighted in my trial. Everything was swept away. Everything was pushed to the side. Well, I really thank you for coming on and, and sharing uh, all of this. And I'm sure this is not a comfortable conversation even now for you, but uh, I admire your bravery for, for confronting it and for admitting your faults and, and for bearing witness to the world, um, what you've 
been through. Yeah, I appreciate you, David. I thank you for having me on Everyday Injustice to discuss these issues. Uh, I appreciate the Ben Free Project for allowing me to participate in this Vanguard Personal Journalism Guild project. And one thing that I would like to leave everybody with is just remember that we're human. Youth Outwalk is human. You know, empathy. Empathy is the unspoken emotion that, that should be more prominent in life. For sure. It would be much easier if everybody locked in a prison were a monster, but most people that are locked in a prison are just humans that made mistakes and that were victims themselves at one point in their lives. Thanks for coming on, Louie. This is Everyday Injustice. I'm your host, David Greenwald. Join us again next time for more tales from the injustice system. Thank you to George Powell and Norman Mousequake Barrett for the use of our opening, Everyday Injustice. You can see more of George's music at www.justiceforgeorgepowell.com.